Welcome back to another fantastic episode, hopefully, of the Lockdown Tactics podcast. Um, another great guest coming up, but we've got fantastic news for our listeners right now. I'm going to pass you over to the Snodcast to inform you all about that. Thanks for the amazing intro as always, Boydie. Listen, it's um, some of the guests we've had on here, mate, has been in, it's, it's been incredible in a short space of time, five to six weeks, um, the donation stuff. But this one really caught my eye. We've got um, something signed, a great gift, a great prize from a Champions League winner. So stay tuned to the very end for your chance to win. Well, as the Snodcast said there, it's an, it's an opportunity to win a fantastic prize. But to do that, um, you know, we're across all platforms, Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts. You need to subscribe to one of those um, or a YouTube channel to win my chance of winning the fantastic prize. But back to this week, Snoddy, who have you got for us? Boy, Dave, we tapped into the world of sport, the elite level, um, one of the biggest characters in the circuit. Um, for me, he's um, he's one I've been I've been dying to get on uh, to. He's a lover of golf, um, and he's you know not only um, the elite level but the elite level banter as well. So, welcome to the show, Andrew Johnson. You've obviously been brave enough to 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 open up with your mental health issues. Did did, did speaking you know because a lot of people they don't want to speak about it. But did speaking come easily to you, opening up? Yeah, it did. Yeah. It was one of the things where I had I had sort of my lowest point end of 2018. I had like a a crazy summer, a hell of a lot of changes, and the pressure I was putting myself on after 2016 was just ridiculous. And I've always been one where yeah, I'll play, I try my best, and whatever happens, I'm like, all right, whatever, I'm gonna have a beer after on a Sunday and relax, you know, and chill out. And that that stopped happening. And I've become more serious and more serious. And I kind of just sort of started beating myself up. And with, without realising it for a year and a half, I was slowly sort of just like punching myself in the head, um, just winding myself up more and more. And then nothing was ever good enough. And that I finished sort of mid-20s in the open. And I, was, I come off and I was just, I was so angry with myself. Oh, I finished 25th. Why well, I finished 20th at Wentworth and things like this. And... Um, and when it kind of, uh, when, when my fiance chose, she was the one that said, you need to go and like get some help. And she organized me to go and speak to someone. And at that time, I didn't want to speak to anyone. I didn't want to have anyone know. And they told me, take a few, take a few months out. And when, when I slowly started sort of working out and understanding why I, I was kind of like doing that to myself and why I, I couldn't even step on the golf course, um, European Tour asked me, yeah, do the blog. And I was like, yeah, why not? Why not? I, I, I just figured, yeah, it's normal. It's happened. I've always kind of said it how it is. And I was just like, why wouldn't I just say it? So yeah. see, look, in terms of, you speak about putting yourself under pressure. Was that after, um, what did you finish? Eighth at Trun, 2016? Yeah. Was it just because, because I think even then you were, you were an up and coming junior and, and very good prospect for the future. Was that because of, you were an overnight success kind of type thing. And to a lot of people, you know, you arrived in the scene and you were different from everybody as well. A hundred percent. It went from, it went from like turning up uh, that Spanish Open 2016 and I, I walk anywhere and I could go anywhere I wanted. And then even, even to up to, up to like Troon, I, I was yeah chilled out. No one knew who I was. It was fine. I was, I was comfortable Whatever. next thing it's like, get asked to go in here, go there. And then, I've got my card for America, and I think the the craziest tournament that still blow my mind was the PGA uh, uh, Boltus Roll in New Jersey that year, 2016. I mean, just yeah, people coming up to me everywhere. I'd walk on the putting green, and everyone around the putting green would start cheering. I'd knock in a putt, they'd start cheering. And to be honest, I didn't know what was going on. I had people coming up and like just coming up to me saying, "Oh, beef," and I'm like. How does he know me? How, yeah. Why is he coming up to me? What what is going on here? And I couldn't get my head around it to be honest. That's that's the bit I kind of struggled. And then I was like re realizing like, are oh, these people at the top of their like top of the game? I've got I've got to do the same. And it was like I've got to win more. I've got to do more. I've got to win more. And that kind of pressure when I didn't win, and then I'd be like, shit, 
didn't win. Great, God, do more. Back to the range, do more. Blah blah blah, like that. And it was just like this ongoing cycle of me just sort of beating myself up, and then I, I was becoming not myself. And where I realise now is I play my best golf when I'm chilled out and I'm happy. Yep. Yeah. Not not when I'm racking my brains and say, yeah, I've had a I've had a bad week. I missed the cut. So long. I go have a few beers, relax, and and crack on next week. It doesn't mean I'm not working hard enough. It's just how I am. And it's, it's understanding, I guess, who, who I am and who I want to be. And I was, I was getting further and further away from being myself. How important is that to actually remind yourself of who you are and what your, what your goals are rather than, you know, because I, I, why I'm saying it is I look at social media right now and a lot of people compare their lives to everybody else's. How important was that for you to say, no, I am Andrew Johnson, this is who I am, and I'll prepare and do the best I put, rather than looking at other golfers and say, I want to be them and chase them down and stuff like that? Yeah, massively. Like, you can read so many articles where it's like, oh, you should, you should be winning one, two, three tournaments a year, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And it's like, yeah, you can have your opinion, but I started to read into all of that them opinions and thinking, oh yeah. shit, like I should be doing that. I should. And it it definitely played a big part on my mind and my thinking where before I'd be like, oh, I don't care. Like, all right, yeah, I had a bad week. Let's go and have another have another go next week. And yeah, the further the further I went away from being myself, the worse I played for a start. And I was I was unhappy. I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. I didn't want to be around the course. I didn't want to sign autographs. I didn't want to speak to anyone. And I was like, is, I, I got very confused at one point. Is this me now? Yeah. Where, where's, the old, where's the old beef gone? It was like that. And but I read something. You, you, were going to, you were going to walk off the golf course and stuff like that as well for missing a couple of shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played in Australia. And that was at the end of uh, 2018. And I'd, I'd hit two. I'd changed coach. And I was working on new stuff and I've always been a drawer of the ball, but it's always been sort of my bad habits make that draw. And I wanted to get away and start hitting it left to right a bit more. And I think that would make me a more consistent golfer. So it's going to take a bit of time to adjust that. And I didn't have the patience. I didn't have the, the mind to think about it. And I hit two, I hit two really bad shots and I lost it. I like, literally exploded. I wanted to just snap every club. And I was just like, I've got to get out of here. I was like, I've got to get out of here. And I walked over to my fiance and I was like, oh, I've got to go. I was like, I'm going to walk off the course. And she kind of grabbed me and was like, no, you're not, you're not going. Yep. You're going to play through this. And I was just like, no, just let me walk off the course. And she didn't let me. And the next four holes, I remember just saying to my caddy, I was just like effing blind and whatever the whole time. And um, I kind of snapped out of it. But that's when... You yeah, see you snapped out it. Did you snap out it? yourself or did you go and speak to someone to try and work together to change things or no i just kind of got through that tournament and i thought okay i've got like four weeks off now over christmas let's just have a break it's just that's all i need is just a break got back to middle east events and it was the same thing i hit i i hit like not even a bad shot and i'd lost i just got i just it wasn't it wasn't good enough that was the problem it wasn't good enough I yeah. did birdie a par five. wasn't good enough. And yeah. that was the problem. And come off the course, again, yeah, just not happy, not myself. Um, went to tee up, went back out to Australia for another event. And I was sitting there. I was going to practice on the Monday. And I was sitting there and I was just, I just said to, I said to my miss, I was like, can't go. She was like, what do you mean? I said, I, can't, I cannot go to the golf course. Cannot go. So I was like, literally, I spoke to the manager. I said, pull me out of the tournament. And, that. and he was like, why? I said, just, just fucking pull me out. And that pulled me, like, pulled me out of the tournament. Again, then we, I spent a couple of weeks trying to... Did your missus understand around. what you were going through? Mm, yeah, I think so. I think it come to a bit of a shock. She knew I, like, I wasn't quite right back in the 2018. And coming in 2019, um, I guess, yeah, we didn't really know what was going to happen, what I was going to be like. I thought I was going to be all right. So I was the one saying, yeah, it'll be fine. Let's crack on. Um, put that kind of brave face on it. Um, and then, yeah, once once that happened, she was like, that's it. Like, we need to speak to someone about it. You need to speak to someone. And I was like, no, I'm not talking to anyone. I don't want to speak to anyone at that point. Really stubborn. 
It's just, no, not happening. Don't need a psychologist. Leave me alone. Fine. I thought that I couldn't talk at that point. I said, just give me a couple of weeks, regroup. I'm going to try again. Went to go. I was in Oman. I, I, play, I practiced on the Tuesday. At the program on the Wednesday, Wednesday morning, I was like, no chance. I'm not going to the golf course. I can't. I can't go to the golf course again like yep. that in the hotel. You can, you, there's no way. There's no way you can get me out of that hotel room. No one could. And... And then, so that's when I flew home and then took the time out, started speaking. And once, once I opened up, I was like, oh, wow. I was like, this is what's happened. Didn't realize the effect that 2016 had on me. Didn't have a clue, like that pressure. I had no idea that I was putting myself under that pressure. Not, not a clue. And um, then it all, it all started to become a bit more, bit more clear. And I kind of said, okay, I'm going to play the British Masters in May. So I had... I had a couple months to sort of just like, yeah, slow down, um, reflect a little bit. And it was just a matter of changing, yeah, changing my outlook. It's like, what do I expect from playing golf? It's like, I want to go and try my best. If it doesn't go well, so be it. We'll have another go the next week. And once I started to sort of think and sort of rewire my brain almost, that's when, that's when I felt, ah, oh, I slowly sort of started to become myself. And don't get me wrong, I still had times last year where I was like this, like this close to pulling out of the tournament. I don't want to get on the plane. I was like, I'd, I'd have a meltdown going to the airport. I'd be looking at flights on my phone. Like, oh, look, 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 I can fly out Wednesday night and play Thursday because I, th- I didn't want to, <laughs> I just didn't want to be yeah. there. And I was having that kind of battle and, Joe was my fiance was the real one who was like, no, 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 just just get on the plane. You're gonna be all right. Just just get through it. Learn from it. It doesn't matter. And the more times I kind of went with that attitude of, look, just go and try my best. If I play shit, I play shit. It yeah, doesn't yeah. matter. And I kind of got through a few more tournaments, got through a few more, kept working with Ben, psychologist, and understanding it. And I think the turning point was the Scottish Open, really, was the big turning point. It was almost like when when big crowds were there shouting at the start of 2016, I was just like, this is mental. Like, I'm loving this. <laughs> and then by that time, 2018, I was like, get me out of here. I yeah. don't want to be here. Like, stop shouting at me. Like, just, just I want it to be like that. Just hide from it. And the Sunday in Scotland, I was just, it was like, yeah, being myself again. I was like looking around, looking at the crowd, looking up and that. Like I said, this is wicked and like really enjoying it. And the same happened at Wentworth uh, last year. And it was like, I could walk on the course, I could go and hit it in the trees and I'd just be like, ah, so what? <laughs> like that, let's, let's, let's try and make four from there and that crack on. And I had that kind of, yeah, I was just myself again. I wasn't putting myself under too much pressure. Yeah, see, see, see speaking about that, obviously just listening is, um, you know, it's great, it's, um, it's brilliant to see somebody you know, coming through the other side, identifying, you know, there is problems there, speaking openly to your, your family because they're the ones you, you, you need to try and stay that macho uh, as such. They say, you know, I'm the I'm the man of the house and, and, and I want to try and, you know, make sure you're all okay. But the biggest thing there, um, just identifying it, Beefy, is that do you think that, they, you know, with the fans, it was, it was a perception they were creating um you know he's this this guy and and, and you know we'll cheer and you know he'll, if you know, he has a laugh and a joy he just loves a few pints and you know to try and change that mindset because you just said there you know wait a minute I'm actually you know I, I do uh, I, I I am on the circuit now I I did make my name um, and and it's like try to you you're, you're you're thinking like the Rory's and different things and putting the pressure on yourself but and almost you're saying you know, I, I want to relax but. It's probably took you to open up, work with Ben Davies, the psychologist, uh, and speak to your family, and and it, and it fits perfectly with the bill of you know the people we've had on here in the lockdown podcast. Is you need to find a routine, you need to find what's right for you. And you say it early in the podcast that you know everybody's different, but you need to find the structure that suits you. Everyone's going to be different. Rory is going to be Rory, and when I started. When I started my downfall putting pressure, it's because I get told a lot, oh, I'm not being serious. I'm not taking golf seriously. I'm a joker. I'm a clown. And, uh, and I was like, well, no, I'm going to prove them wrong. 
and that and practice work harder, which yep. I, I didn't necessarily need to do. I just needed the most important thing about golf is, is headspace. It's being clear, having a clear, clear mind. And that's the first thing. Yeah. You've got to put the work in, you've got to practice and, and I do. And that, but just because I like to have a beer and chill out doesn't mean I'm not putting the work in. It's like, even with like my training, I'm, I'm a bigger bloke to, to other people. And it's like, oh, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be deadlifting. I shouldn't be squatting, powerlifting. I like lifting weights. I like, I like that. And it's like, I stopped doing that because I was like, am I doing the right or wrong thing? And I got very lost. And I was like, actually, do you know what? I want to do it. So I'm going to do it. I'm not going to injure myself. It's not, I know it's not bad for my golf. So why am I not going to do it? I like to yeah. do a bit of boxing. Why am I going to, I'm going to do a bit of boxing or whatever. And I think it's about, yeah, being happy in your own place. It's going to, it's going to make you happy on the golf course and shoot better scores, play better yeah. golf because you're in a better headspace. A lot, of, a lot of people we've had in the in the, in the podcast as well, uh, Andrew is is, is um, you know they're speaking about their struggles and it's you know continuous uh, every single week, month, day, or well, day, month, week, whatever. Um, do you know what your trigger points are and how to you know to deal with them? Do you feel as if when you put do you know when you're putting too much pressure on yourself again, etc. Like that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's expectation all the time, and I mean this. I've realized it and it's not just golf, it's in real life as well. It's expectation of what I think playing golf all my life and that expectation always falls on me. So I always expect like, I've got to be like perfect all the time and learning that you're never going to be perfect is I think the first, my first trigger, the first thing I say, like, you're not going to be perfect today. And that you might go and practice. Practice not going to be perfect today. You're not gonna. You're not gonna go and shoot 18 under every day. And it's like that's the first trigger I'd say for me. It's like anything can happen today. Just because you put the work in as well, you're not guaranteed to go and shoot a good score. And I think be prepared for that. I'm trying to shoot the best score I can, whether it's 66 or 76 is the best I've done. And I just got to take it on the chin, regardless. Walk away. And the bigger perspective is that I'm going to go back and play with my daughter and have some fun, you know, with my fiancé and my, my daughter, and it's not the end of the world, is it? And yep. I think, like, it's all, it's keeping everything in perspective. It's only golf. It's, it's not, it's not that important in the grand scheme of things. But, yeah, of course I want to go out. I want to win tournaments. want to play Ryder Cup. But if it doesn't happen, so be it. I'm going to have a beer and eat some chicken wings. So what? <laughs> I love it. I love that attitude. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Do you know something else? I'm going to go back to it. And, I, and it's it's key for, for us in this in this podcast. When you, when, you, when you spoke earlier about going on the golf course and then saying, right, I'm going to take a week away and then I'm going to go back to the course in a couple of weeks' time and then that didn't really work out. And then, right, I'm going to have a month off and I'm going to go back. You said that you didn't speak, you didn't, you didn't want, to, you didn't want help and everything. So, for anybody listening to this right now, for people out there who say, "It's okay, I'll get back to work. It's okay, I'll get back to doing this. It's okay, I'll get back." To, like you need to go and tackle the problem, you know, the issue right now, rather than saying, "That's ah, okay, further down the line, I'll be okay." You need to go and address, you know, the problem as it, you know, as it stands. Hundred percent. I, I, I bottled it up inside and. Yeah, you can you can describe it however way you want. Like you just keep filling a bin up, and you just keep like shoving it down, shoving it down until it's going to explode somewhere. And that that relief was for me. Say, I'm going to take two weeks out. Was getting away from problems because I couldn't get I couldn't get on the golf course. I couldn't mentally get. I couldn't play. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'd get away and I'd be fine off the golf course, not a problem. But as soon as I knew I was getting back on a plane, going to a tournament, the anxiety, the, the pressure, um, all the thoughts that were going through my head. And I was just squeezing it, bottling it up. And I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm not going to tell anyone. And it was just eating away. And the first thing I'd say is, yeah, just talk to someone, man. Because as soon as I started opening up and talking and understanding what was happening and what happened, things become a lot clearer. And that's, I think that's one of the only ways that, you, that it's going to help is just pull someone to the side and, and open up and chat. And there's nothing, it can happen to anyone. I totally believe it can happen to anyone, any walk of life. It doesn't matter what you do. 
it doesn't matter what work, what line, whatever. It can happen to anyone. And everyone's vulnerable at some point, and it doesn't make you a weaker person. I think it makes you stronger because you understand yourself and you have them triggers after it. And I think once you open up and talk, it's, it's normal. It's normal. Something different now. We'll go somewhere different now. What's your, what's your favourite course in Scotland? Oh, my God. There's so many good golf courses. Um, I'm sandwiched right in between Troon and Tunbury. Troon's got a special place in my heart, yeah. I'm going to have to say Troon. Troon, yeah. <laughs> it's got a real special place in my heart, yeah. Why is that? Because the Open? Yeah, because the Open. I mean, walking down there on Sunday, on Saturday and Sunday was just mind-blowing i'll never forget it it's just got that special yeah special place in my heart beefy boy these course his favorite course is four course as <laughs> 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 it's four courses that's what he likes my man don't worry about that <laughs> <laughs> love it love it and by the way that's just for dinner <laughs> yeah, the, the, you're laughing. The big man knows exactly where I'm coming from. By the way, uh, is good. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing. What golfer would you? What golfer would you love to be in? And uh, I spend lockdown with. Oh man, I'm trying to think of someone who's really tidy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, who's really good at cooking and tidy? Um, <laughs> who's good at cooking? Who's not going to eat all my chicken wings? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've seen, do you know what? I've seen uh, Jimmy Walker cook some unreal food. So I'm going to say him. Yeah, yeah. he's cooked some unreal food. Yeah. <laughs> He's, I'll he's, happily, yeah. If he cooks the food, I'll happily clean it up. It's no problem. Beefy, <laughs> listen, you've got a great sense of humour. It's honestly brilliant. But, you know, was there any comedians? Um, you know, it's just the questions we threw in the lockdown. Um, we had some uh, some banter. Wait, is there any comedians growing up that, you know, played a part on you being such a character? Uh, I mean, I never forget watching Peter Kay's first stand up. <laughs> I mean, brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely class. And, one of my favourite programmes, 8 out of 10 cats. Sean Locke, for me. Yeah. He probably. just does it. Yeah, Sean Locke, for me. Them two. Yeah, he has me in absolute stitches. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. He's, listen, just before we just before we wrap up here, I know you're a big Will Ferrell fan. Right? He, he's not, he, he, honestly, he's never seen Step Brothers. I have. I have. Was, yeah, show me some lines then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, yeah. we're there. We're there. We're there to Google. We're getting our tuxedo. You're interviewed as a yeah. team. I tell you, I tell you what to do. I tell you what to do. If you if, if you give me some lines out, if you let me hear some lines, I'll, 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 that might refresh my memory. <laughs> it's not happening. No, it's not, not happening. happening. Not well, happening. <laughs> drum set right now. It's not happening. Not happening. Let's, 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 <laughs> let's we'll move on to football you're a big Arsenal fan it's been a difficult period for them recently as well but um, with Mikel Arteta in there now what, what do you think uh, you know for them going forward I don't know I always had the view of it when when Wenger left it was a case for me saying is the board and how Arsenal run good enough to get another manager in, and I don't think so. I think I'll say it would do all right, but the board have got to be better and back him, get the signings they want, not let players go on, on a free. I mean, it's ridiculous. So I think there's a lot deeper problems there than just the manager. Yeah. How frustrating is that as a fan when you see, you know, like the rest of, you know, when, you, when you're obviously growing up and Arsenal are winning things, and then all of a sudden the players are leaving and leaving for free transfers and all the rest. Uh, our teams are spending a fortune and winning things. How how annoying, frustrating is that as an Arsenal fan? It is. I think a lot of fans are so angry because, you know, we all get told that, all right, they're going to build a new stadium. It's going to take like five, ten years, whatever, to pay off the stadium and then we're going to be able to compete. And all of a sudden, it's, it's been that time and they can't compete. They're nowhere near competing with likes of City, Liverpool. Nowhere near. And... Yeah, it is a bit frustrating. And you see, yeah, Ramsey go on a free. 
which is just, yeah, mind-blowing. And then wrong players. I mean, Ozil's contract, I think, is bonkers for that. And you give him that much money. I mean, Ramsey's playing better football. I, I don't blame him one bit for going to Juve. I mean, a top, top football team. And it is. It's frustrating to watch. But I think, again, it's like... I've just learned to manage them expectations. I think fourth is an amazing season for Arsenal. If they can nick an FA Cup or whatever, Europa League is good at the moment. We you speak about Ozil's wages there. He's just he's just a wee, the, the, the little bracket below Snoddy's at West Ham. <laughs> <laughs> oh see, see, we speak about um, you know Arsenal. We played Arsenal at the um, in the first part of the season, beefy um, at the Olympic Stadium, and you know. The, the the players you could see a fear factor in. I think it was when Shaka was having a you know a bit of uh, stuff for the crowd and stuff, um, and you could see like, a fear factor within the squad. Um, and you know we we the beat is three one right, but it was they had the players that you know took the chances at the right time. But we we battered Arsenal. A bit, we lost three one. That's why, as I said to you, you know the elite level and they take their chances. But we then played them um, at at the Emirates under a. And they tried to they tried to take the ball. They tried to play football. They beat us. Um, well, no, it was a VR decision. We had some great chances in the game. Um, again at the Emirates, but you can just sense when you know played at the Emirates maybe six seven years ago, and then at the Emirates now there isn't that same uh, there isn't that same feeling about the stadium uh, where it's like you know the, the, we're just going to turn up and win. It's uh, it's it's so different. And Jack Walsh spoke about it in the uh, the podcast about saying you know. Maybe having the right characters as such and, and the mentality to you know deal with that expectation. Do you feel that as a fan? Yeah, I find it amazing. I know like this is gonna sound completely stupid, right? I used to play five a side with my cousins, and they used to argue all the time, and a couple of times, like I lost my mind, and that if we were losing, and I'd like go and like grab one of them and like sub them and stuff, <laughs> and like you would, you, yeah, you would, because you've got rolling subs by the side. And um, I just in that team, someone does something or doesn't do something they're supposed to, and they're all hugging each other. And I just find, why is no one grabbing someone and, yeah. like, demanding, like, the work rate or whatever they're doing? I just don't see that, like, fire in the team. We used to get more angry playing five aside than watching these guys. Yep, 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 yep. I can see it right now, by the way. I can see it right oh. now. The end of the season. Well, on this one thing, Andrew Johnson is going in as a coach and there's going to be <laughs> rumbles in the training field to get them going. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like on a golf course. Like, if, if I do something stupid, I go mental at myself, like, you know? And yeah. that, and it's like, I don't see that, like, fire or passion yeah. there. And that where someone's, like, pulling, like, you're out of line. No one's there. You're out of line. Get back in. Like, Do you think there's been an acceptance like, from everybody at Arsenal that, that it is what it is now in terms of, you know, not getting into that top four, we'll just bring players in? You know, because we always hear about middle of the, the road Premier League clubs that are just, you know, they float around if they win a cup. Or, you know, is, is Arsenal now in that bracket where you think they're no longer, you know, the, the elite? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I think I think finishing fourth is a good, is a great season for them. I think a lot of clubs have overtaken them. And if they, if yeah, if they nick an FA Cup or whatever, it's it's a good season, and that's frightening to say that when you look at it 15 years ago, and start building a new stadium and things like that, and they, they've gone completely backwards, and yeah, I just I don't see that I don't see that passion there at the, at the club. Do you need like a Patrick Vieira, a, a Patrick Vieira, a, a Tony Adams type leader? <sighs> Massively, yeah. Massively, and I think like that's uh, that's what I hope Arteta can get back to. They need a few leaders in there. Someone comes in if they're messing around, they get it gets put straight right away. You're not doing that. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't mess around playing the ball there. And yeah. then you... I think Snoddy's got to be available in a free transfer in a few weeks anyway. So you know, he might he might be one that could. Me and Beefy get in as a team in the tuxedo, just three D and people just. Well, Andrew, the big question is, all the Arsenal fans out there will want to know, who is the biggest fan, Arsenal fan, yourself or Piers Morgan? Well, I think Piers makes out he's a massive Arsenal fan. 
gonna, yeah, that's gonna hurt him. <laughs> Makes you say that. I just like winding him up. Um, <laughs> Oh, it's difficult. I mean, we're both like really passionate about it. Love football. Um, yeah, we both love it. And I think like, yeah, I think he sees the same thing. It's, it's just can be frustrating where, like you said, with the fans and stuff and watching the players and they just seem to become not that that tough Arsenal where they had George Graham there. It's not the same. And, and then under Wenger, having that back five and that toughness, it, it's frustrating. I think he feels exactly the same as me. But I'm still going to say me. Same to you. <laughs> One last thing. <laughs> Who, who's your, your favourite Arsenal player of all time? Oh, well, Ian Wright is the reason I support Arsenal. So, funny enough, my dad was a Tottenham fan. And, yeah, but it was Ian Wright when I was growing up. He had that big smile, just loved the way he played, and it was appealing to me. And he was the reason I supported Arsenal, so I've got to say him. Ian Wright. And yeah. the last one, definitely. Who's your favourite current player? And you've got to say somebody. <laughs> Obama Young. Obama Young. Yeah, without that, I think he's class. Yeah. And who's the best? Got it. Here's one. Who's the best? Obama Young or Ian Wright? Who would you rather? You've got one striker yeah. up top. Who Who are you choosing, Beefy? <laughs> right, he has to be. I can't go against Wright. Go on, boy, Ian, right, right, right. Ian, right, Ian, right, right. right. So, <laughs> so we're saying, so we're, that's us. We've got Ian Wright, hero. And you're a bigger Arsenal fan than Piers Morgan. Yeah. There we go. Well, Beefy, um, you know, we think it's you know great having the life of a footballer, but, you know, what, what's it like um, in the lifestyle where a golfer playing all the Fantastic courses and travelling around the world. Yeah, I mean, it's great fun. I, I guess similar to football, any other sport, it's, it's the competing. That's the best thing about it. There's no no doubt about it. You know, rocking up tournaments and, and trying to win, trying to put yourself in the mix on Sunday is the best thing. And yeah, we're lucky to, to be able to travel the world. I think that can take its toll sometimes. I think um, you're jumping on a plane every week. Uh, changing time zones a lot. That that can be real tricky to get settled. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we're lucky. We're lucky to be able to travel. And some of the courses we play are amazing, like Leopard Creek in South Africa on the edge of the Safari Park. National Park is amazing and things like that. So, yeah, growing up as a kid and thinking, oh, think like 10 years down the line, we'll be playing in South Africa or wherever, Australia, places like that. It kind of still blows my mind. We well, had success winning the Spanish Open in 2016, but um, that was your first one in the European Tour. How good was that to find to to find to sink that final putt and, and get that victory? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it's quite a funny story to be honest. I'd played I'd played well earlier on in the season, and I'd gone to America to see my sister, and I took my clubs out there, but I, I, I hardly played out there for a few weeks. I just enjoyed the beaches and the weather and chilling out. <laughs> eating loads of chicken wings and whatnot. And um, <laughs> I turned up for Valderrama like really un uh, unprepared. And I turned up on the Monday and I, I played nine holes around the golf course. And I was like, oh my God, how am I going to get the golf ball around this course? It's so hard. And luckily my coach was there and we started working on something. And I just had this one thought for the whole week. And as soon as I kind of got there on Tuesday, Wednesday, that one thought, I just kept with it the whole time. And even on Sunday in, in contention, that's all I was thinking about. And it kind of distracted me from like the, what was going on in the tournament. I was like, all right, it doesn't matter. I'll just work on this one thought. And it's something that I've tried to try to keep um, like all my career after that, really. But yeah, that, that feeling of winning and knocking that putt in on the last. I know there was um, uh, Yus Lauten behind me. You could make birdie and take it to a playoff. And that was probably the worst bit out of all of it. Even knocking in like a four footer on the last for par, um, watching him, you're just gonna think, oh, he's gonna make birdie, he's gonna go to a playoff. And till, until he didn't, that was like the nice relief after, I'd say. See, on that, see when you're in the clubhouse, like waiting and somebody maybe behind you, and what's the thought process? You know, what's, what, what's going through your head? You might be staying out practice and stuff, but when you know somebody else can get there for a playoff and you're off the course, you know, for the time being, what's, what's going through your head then? I think, yeah, I always take it as there. Yeah, it's going to be a playoff. I always. Do you prepare for the worst case scenario? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, 
yeah, then go and prepare. I knew I saw my card. He was only the group behind, so I didn't really need to go and warm up. But I was just, yeah, watching what was going on. And, um, yeah, I generally think it's the best thing, you know, prepare for the playoff. And if it doesn't happen, so be it. If it does, then you're prepared for it. You're not in the sort of state of, oh, my God, I can't believe he hold a putt or hold a bunker shot, whatever it is. Yeah. So, so see, like when you go back to a team sport, you know, it might be sometimes that you're not having a, a good game. And for example, if it's me and Robert and I can, you know, look to him to help me out and stuff like that. But see, when you're out there on your own, like, do you feel under pressure on the golf course? You can get some pretty tough times. Yeah. You get out on the course and you're not playing well, or you might, it might not be your whole game. It might be a certain part of your game. You might not be playing the bunk as well. So you turn up at a tournament some bunk is obviously going to have more sand, different types of sand, and you're just struggling with it. And you get in one bunk, you get a shot, and you're like, oh, my God. Like, if someone could come and take this for me, that'd be nice. And you get in them situations on the golf course, certain tee shots where it doesn't suit your eye. And I think that's the real mental side where you've just got to stand up and commit to that shot because, yeah, you have to go and play it. It's like no one can bail you out. Yeah, who was your who was your favourite golfer when you were growing up? Oh, from from a young age, really young. I remember watching a fella called Chichi Rodriguez. He used to, if he hold a putt or something, he used to do like the big sword thing across the green. <laughs> um, and it was always it always like stood out, and it was all always like the entertainers that stood out. Obviously, Tiger was like when I was growing up as a kid. That's when it, like golf like really blew up and. He made it what it is today. You had him watching Mickelson, watching him around the green. Uh, some of the shots he plays, just amazing. Um, yeah, I'd say people like that. Who do you think's for you right now? Who's the best in the world right now? Rory. Rory. Easy? Or why? When, just consistency? When he's on, no one, not many people will beat him when he's on. He's, what, he's, what do you so, think? he's so good. What, what's separated? Because, I, mean, I mean, I know you look at him and even in the TV and, I mean, I, I, went, I was at the, the Open at Troon and that as well. Like, he doesn't look as if, you know, like the big, powerful man, but he's like solid, unbelievable. Like, what, what separates him from, you know, the, the, the rest? He just, you, you know, you see it in sport where you get them top guys, they're just, they're just better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. It just oh, It's like your Ronaldo, your Messi's, whatever you want to call it. I thought um, you were going to say your Snodgrasses, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best, the best at podcasts, not to do it in the hell. <laughs> <laughs> and I played with him, God, back in the junior days. We must have been about seventeen, eighteen, and he's just amazing. Then, like, just yeah, amazing. But what did he? What did he do? Even as it, because like. I mean, in football, you, you know, we all start out and we're all this, you know, they're all, you're all the same, running about the field, everybody can kick it, everybody can run, everybody's got a decent touch, and then all of a sudden you start to separate and everything. When did you feel as if Rory McIlroy separated himself from the rest of the group that he was in as such to, you know, jump into this elite bracket? When he won, I think it was the US Open or PGA, when he won it by like eight shots. Yeah. Yeah, that was like, yeah, when you win a major by that distance, it's like... But even as a, as a kid, I mean, as well, if you're coming through and you see him and, and like... No, because I'm sure everybody with the exact same, the amount of effort and everything you put in, but what, was it just his talent? Just, oh, he works hard at his game. Mm -hmm. He works hard. He's a hard worker. And it's, whatever you call it, talent, hard work. He's just, he's just got it. The way he mm -hmm. hits the ball is just, when he's on, he hits it better than everyone else. His, mm -hmm. his game's better than everyone else. I, th I don't know what you can really put it down to. It's the same as when, when Tiger was at his best. And he's gonna, when he's on, he's going to win most tournaments. But that's the scary thing about Tiger, is you look at how many tournaments he's won, it's frightening. It's frightening mm -hmm. what he did in golf. Because if, if that's what I'm saying, when Rory's playing his best, yeah, he's going to win tournaments all his lifetime. See, one but last question, one last question on that. Another is... tournament, I'll beat Rory. Yeah, that's golf. There's so many tournaments, and you can't be on all the time. That's what makes Tiger so special as well. We've we'll spoke about this in the, in the lockdown tactics podcast as well of the fear of opposition. Do you feel as if 
there is maybe like in, in the football tunnel, teams will look on and say, we're beating the tunnel. Do you feel as if Rory on his day has got that in golf, like Tiger did back there? When people are going out there saying, listen, if he plays, he wins. End of story. Not like Tiger did. Um, I, I think, yeah, Tiger had something different to, to any other golfer I've seen ever. Mm-hmm. As I said, like the amount, the amount of tournaments he's won is frightening. And you remember he's been injured a few years, and I can't remember what the stat exactly was. <laughs> How many tournaments in such a short space of time? It's just ridiculous. I think he's the only one that had that massive fear factor. I say a lot of the players aren't aren't. I would say not fearful for Rory. They know if he's playing well, he's going to be hard to beat. But I think a lot of people felt. If, yeah, if, Tiger, if Tiger's up there on Sunday, we, we ain't got a chance. See, see, when you're rubbing shoulders with him, be fair, and, you, and you're rubbing shoulders with him, get to, you know, and the you know the big tournaments is, is such. Is there a mindset thinking to yourself, you know, because we do speak about people's mentality on the podcast, um, getting into an elite level. Yes, you, you know, you need to have an attitude to get there. But when you're on there, is it you know one bad shot, um, especially sort of for an, for an early age, you think to yourself. At competition level, one bad shot, you know, th- those lads won't be doing that. You know, if they're on it, um, they, they'll be. So you almost need to, you, know, you speak about the, the, the balance, but also having the mentality for, you know, this is four or five days. At, you know, don't think about the one shot. We're here for four or five days. It's a, you know, a longer, you know, period to keep yourself focused for. 100%, yeah. Regardless, in tournament of four days, you're going to hit some bad shots. You're going to miss a few parts. It's, that's golf. And it's all about it's all about managing managing your game at the right time. You know, when when you're on, it's like attack, go at the flags. Um, yeah. If you're not quite on, sometimes it's be a bit sensible. Difficult pin, be wary, hit the middle of the green. Yeah. You know, put yourself in a position to win on Sunday. Give yourself a chance. And it's it's sometimes game management as well in that respect. And yeah, don't don't go for a stupid pin if you're not feeling a hundred percent. Just just be yeah. sensible. That's by the way. That's been my problem. I always go for the pin. <laughs> <laughs> that by the, that has been my problem over the years. I'm tell, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting no, back in this golf course. Gilmore. I'm a happy girl. I am for the tree to then hit the pin and then hold. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting it completely wrong. <laughs> See, now listen. There's a, there's a lot of talk right now about the um, the Ryder Cup, um, and it's it's the same probably scenario with the. You know the Premier League starting back. Uh, with, you know the fans, no fans. How how, how are you feeling uh, both sides? How how do you? Yeah, I know, I know you've got a great relationship with the fans. They always take to you and stuff. How, how do you feel about it returning? I think it's good that it's returning. Um, yeah, not having fans, the atmosphere isn't as good. If you can't have fans at Ryder Cup, I don't think it should go ahead. I think Just because that, that's do. what makes that tournament. It's yeah, what yeah. makes that tournament. Yeah, um, and yeah, I, I don't see how you can play it behind closed doors. But I think like regular tour events, it's one of the things that yeah, we just got to crack on with, get on with it. Yeah, how different it will that be for you? For you, how different will that be for yourselves? Like playing with, with no crowd or that? Because you're one of the fans' favourites, and you're always getting the cheers. And will it be difficult like to go out there and play without fans? No, I don't think so. It'd be like playing on a on a Monday or Tuesday playing. Uh, practice round and stuff. I don't think I don't think it'd be too bad for us. I think yeah, be a lot... I'm on their Tuesday. I'm on their Tuesday. There's no two million prize money up for grabs, <laughs> Beefy. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I I generally think I don't think it'd be too bad. I don't think a lot of the players will be too bothered by it. Um, and I just see it, I just see it as one of them things where that's the state it is at the moment. Let's just crack on and get on with it, and hopefully things go back to normal like sooner than later. Is is that one of your? Is that the ultimate goal, Beefy? Is to be part of a you know a winning Ryder Cup team? You see the you know the, the lads the you know the lift and the confidence it gives them, and, and and as you just said there, you know the the team you know having the banter and having the crack is you know especially getting the bragging rights. Is that is that the ultimate goal? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'd love to play a Ryder Cup. That's that's always been goal of mine. Hundred um, percent, I think. You watch it and you, you see the passion and you never really see that from golfers a lot of the time. But when you see when you see Ryder Cup comes and yeah, having that team thing is, is a bit different. 
It's, See, it's, I mean, the, the, the Ryder Cup's obviously a team event and you get to, to work with the, the other players and everything, but who, I mean, you're one of the characters on tour, but who else is, you know, the, the, the real characters and you have a laugh and a joke away from Because every time we see them on the TV, it's always the, you know, the real serious stuff. And you, and you can understand why, but who else is the characters around the, the circuit? Uh, I mean... I mean, Eddie Pepper was a good lad. I've known I've known him, Tommy, for for years since we were juniors, and they're both they're both great lads. I mean, Eddie, yeah, Eddie's a bit quieter, but yeah, he's funny, man. He's got a great sense of humour. Um, Michael Lorenzo Vera, um, another good guy. Yeah, always have a good laugh with him. Um, again, known him for for a long time now, and a lot of the guys, a lot of the guys, once you get to know, go spit. Goes a bit different because, like, you might walk past a lot of people on the range, say hi, how how you doing, blah blah blah. But I think a lot of them you don't get to know because you're off doing your own thing, and that's mm-hmm. like the difference. And I'd be really interested to see, like, a Ryder Cup, how much more you get to know the know the other players a lot more. Do you think? <clears throat> see on that the team sport, and I know the Ryder Cup, you're obviously um, everybody's going to win. But do you think? The elite golfers, even if it's for that, they few days will swap, you know, their wee tricks of the trade and everything. Or is it like, because we, we spoke about, you know, the England squad, you know, the, the golden generation and the, the separation and stuff like that. In this, in an individual sport, do you, do you feel as if like they would pass or, or, or you know, explain their, you know, what they do going around golf courses, that little bit, that 1%, 2% to get the gains? Oh. Because what I will say I is think... that's one thing that's always been labelled at Tiger Woods as well. What Four. that he that he's he's what? always he's he's beat he's had that boom, siege yeah. mentality once you know what I mean and that's why when I mean I, I'm from the outside in when you're when you're reading things and that you you you'd think that he you know it's, it's maybe with the with the USA team he's been one that's a few problems. I think there was an interesting one a while back where Steve Stricker was helping Woods with his putt and I think maybe one Ryder Cup during the tour and I think like. That will vary on, yeah, person person. Some people might not want to give it away. I think, I think like the the big player Rory's and and people like that won't won't be that fast. And if you say, look, I'm I'm struggling a little bit here, I think you'll put arm around you, ride a cup, and and help you out. What was your earliest memory of the of the Ryder Cup? Oh, it must have been, oh. It was, I think it was the Belfry one. I think was it Belfry. I can't think who holds the winning putt now. Was it? Was it? I think did Paul McGinley win the hold a putt on the 18th. I think to win to win one of his win the match, win the Ryder Cup. I think it was. I remember watching that. Yeah, I think I remember watching that with, yeah, with like my brother and my dad and my mum and things like that, just at home. Yeah. What would like? What would you say has been the greatest Ryder Cup? Uh, Medina. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, that comeback. Come back. Just, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. We've, we've loved, we've loved having you on, mate. We um, the football talk is maybe for an hour podcast. We do not know, but we we, we really appreciate having your time, having us on. All the best. Um, you know, when we come out of the lockdown and get back into things. Um, thanks very much for your time and good luck with your with your career. With one last thing, guys. one last, one last thing for me before we go. What would your last message, you know, to anybody, you know, it's been suffering with mental health from, you know, Andrew Johnson to the rest of the world right now? What would your message be? It's normal, and open up and talk. It's not a weakness. Brilliant. Well, well that- thanks very much. Great having you on, as, as Snoddy said. Fantastic, great insight to the golfing world as well, and and. Um, Hopefully see you winning some tournaments soon. That's wicked. Cheers, guys. Brilliant. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers. Cheers. Nice one. Oh, it's not that. that was another great episode. And I, I, for me, the insight to you know that golfer's world where it could be lonely sometimes as well, I thought it was fantastic. And then obviously bringing it up to date with the football stuff, he's Arsenal, um, well, Arsenal being his team. But I tell you what, See backstage when he was talking about inviting us down for a game of golf, and that I ain't interested in that. There's only one thing I want to get down there and meet Beefer. I want some of these chicken wings, mate. I want some <laughs> of these chicken wings. But I tell you, <laughs> you're right, you're right. <laughs> just on, just on that. Um, let's get back to you know you mentioned the prize at the top of the show. What is it? 
boy, the special prize, mate. Spe special. Um, these uh, these signed boots uh, are for the Scotland captain, Champions League winner Andy Robertson. Um, he's he's given me the show. Um, he wanted to keep a hold of him. So you know how special it was, how much that means to the Liverpool fans to beat um, Man United. So he's donated um, these boots, um, obviously for your chance to win. Um, these boots, you have to subscribe uh, to all of our platforms, um, which you'll find is Spotify, Podbean, and Apple Podcast. Um, subscribe to all of them, and more, most importantly, our YouTube channel. You need to subscribe for your chance to win that special prize. Thanks very much for tuning in tonight. I love that. Um, I love the prize as well. It's amazing. Um, and listen, stay tuned for some great names coming up. Um, on the Lockdown Tactics podcast. Very nice.